everyone gets them unwanted robocalls. We have pre-approvals ready in your area. Kathy Dragata can't stand them. Very annoying all times of the day. I ignore them and I ignore them and they still call back. Thank you for calling the Clearly IT Secure Attestation Service. The caller ID presented to us is 154-178-78870. Verification passed. This call has an attestation level of A. The call was certified by Clearly IT. What you just saw me do was check the attestation level of my own company's phone number. This relates to the telecommunication industry's stir shaken regulations that are designed to help prevent robocalling. You know, those pesky calls that you get asking about extending your car's warranty, urging you to reduce your IRS debt, or telling you that you've won a Marriott vacation. It's a prolific problem that has wasted unimaginable amounts of people's time over the years. In this video, we're gonna mourn the death of my own SIP business, Crosstalk SIP, and I'm gonna explain why we had to shut down that service. But before we get to that, we need to understand why the FCC's new stir shaken regulations are such a profound change to the telecommunications industry and how these new rules are designed to help stop robocalling. One of the reasons robocalls are so prevalent is that the phone spammers can simply spoof their outbound caller ID phone number to make it look like you're receiving a call from the same town, regardless of where in the world that call is actually originating. Scammers know that people are more likely to pick up a call from their own local area code and open source telephony applications such as Asterisk and Vici Dial make adjusting your outbound caller ID on the fly relatively simple. So enter STIR Shaken. The STIR stands for Secure Telephony Identity Revisited and the Shaken stands for Secure Handling of Asserted Information Using Tokens. Honestly, it seems like some James Bond fan just came up with the acronym first and the definition later, but that's a story for a different day. Shaken, but not stirred. Essentially, Stir Shaken is a technology that uses digital certificates to ensure that the calling number is secure. Or in other words, by using a digital certificate to sign your phone calls, you're verifying that you are who you say you are and you're given a score that the receiving carrier uses to help determine whether or not you're a scam caller or a robocaller. The score that you receive is called your attestation level and there are three levels of attestation. Level A or full attestation means that the service provider has authenticated the calling party and the calling party is authorized to use the phone number that's being used as the outbound caller ID for the call. Or in other words, the carrier knows who you are and they know that you own that phone number that you're calling from. Level B or partial attestation means that the service provider knows who you are, but they can't verify the phone number that you're using as your outbound caller ID. So imagine for instance, a situation where you're using follow me to forward calls that came into your corporate PBX out to your cell phone, right? The caller ID that's sent to your cell phone originates from your PBX but it's often overwritten to appear as the caller ID of the outside caller, right? So your PBX is sending a call out to your phone, but it is essentially spoofing the caller ID so that you know where that call came from. Finally, we have level C or gateway attestation, which means that your service provider cannot verify who sent the call and also can't verify that the phone number is owned by the calling party. Now, this is the worst score that you can receive and calls that receive this attestation level are most likely to be marked as spam when they hit your cell phone. So in order to be compliant with the new stir shaken regulations, all calls that originate from a service provider, A, have to pass through an SBC, also known as a session border controller, B, they have to be signed with a digital certificate, and C, they have to be scored with a particular attestation level. The attestation level and other information in the SIP header is then used by the receiving carrier to determine whether a call is legitimate or not. Now, if you wanna check your own phone number's attestation level like I just did at the beginning of this video, you can do so by calling into Clearly IP's attestation checker at 920-666-1392. This is gonna tell you your caller ID, whether you've passed verification, your call's attestation level, and which service provider certified the call. If you call into that phone number and receive anything other than attestation level A, 
you're gonna wanna fix your outbound dialing or you risk being marked as spam. So overall, this is great, right? I mean, bandwidth.com states that between three to five billion robocalls are made every single month, and research suggests that 40% of those calls are thought to be fraud related. It's a huge fraud industry and a very big problem here in the US as well as throughout the world. If you're a major SIP service provider like Clearly IP or Level 3 or bandwidth.com, it's pretty trivial to get your digital certificate and to start signing calls through your session border controllers. But what about the little guys, right? What about the crosstalk SIPs of the world who don't have their own SBC infrastructure in place, but rather resell wholesale minutes to our customers? So I started Crosstalk SIP about three years ago as a way to provide cost-effective SIP trunking to our customers and so that we'd have full control over their PBX as well as phone services. More control over a customer's SIP services means better customer service in the event of any sort of issue. This gave our customers a one-stop shop for all of their telephony needs, and over the past few years, we built up a nice customer base of about 60 or 70 different customers. Now in the back end, the service that we were using as the upstream carrier was VoIP Innovations. We started Crosstalk SIP, and then about a year after we started reselling VoIP Innovations wholesale minutes, uh, VI was actually purchased by Sangoma. But for the most part, the service has been incredibly solid. They provided the software for us to create invoices and bill out our customers every month as Crosstalk SIP, and we purchased the minutes used for our customers wholesale directly from VI. Now, as much as we enjoyed being the carrier for our customers, as it allowed us to set up fair pricing, it gave us the opportunity to ensure that we had full control over our customers' SIP trunking, and allowed us to make some extra money on the side, it was a hell of a lot of work to set up and maintain. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into reselling SIP services than you might imagine. First, you have to be properly registered with the FCC as well as any state where you sell VoIP services. Second, you have to ensure that you're charging the appropriate local, state, and federal taxes for all of the services that you're providing, and you have to remit those taxes to all of the proper authorities. On top of that, you have to bill your customers in a timely fashion as well as deal with any customer service issues that pop up. Now, when we're reselling SIP trunks to our customers, we're paying VoIP innovations for the wholesale minutes as well as the billing platform. We're also paying a separate third party to calculate and apply the taxes that go onto those bills that we send out. Uh, and I'm paying my own employees as well to set up and maintain those SIP trunks for our customers. So all of this combined means that once we started turning a profit with our Crosstalk SIP side business, we were only making about 15 to 20% profit margin every month, and it took a heck of a lot of maintenance to keep up that level of profit. But with Stir Shaken now in effect, the way that we were doing business as Crosstalk SIP was no longer valid. We didn't need to have the redundant SBC infrastructure to terminate and originate all of the calls that our customers made. We had no need to sign every call that passes through our system and generate an attestation level. I mean, VoIP Innovations handled all of that stuff for us. So then what would it actually have taken for us to become compliant with the FCC's new regulations? Well. In order to better understand what's involved in being fully compliant with Stir Shaken, I wanted to speak with Tony Lewis, who's the CEO of Clearly IP, and a guy who's gone through the process of being fully Stir Shaken compliant for his own SIP trunking service. All right, Tony, thank you for being here with me. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. It's always fun to, to jump on a call with you. So before we jump into all that Stir Shaken stuff, I should say that Tony and I run a open source PBX training. I think maybe, Tony, the only open source PBX training these days. I don't think Sangoma has one anymore. Is that right? Not that I'm aware of. Definitely not an in-person <laughs> one. I think we're the only ones doing an in-person training class. <laughs> yeah. So full disclosure, Tony and I do work together as part of this training course. Uh, and we do have another one coming up in just about two months in November in uh, beautiful Appleton, Wisconsin. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you check out events.clearlyip.com. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We want to talk about <laughs> Stir Shaken and sort of the disruption in the voice over IP industry that's happening because of this. You know, Tony, you you run a you know a large carrier. Crosstalk SIP at its height, we were doing 130 to 140,000 calls per month, which I think is a lot. But by comparison, you know, what's the size of, of the call processing that you do on a monthly basis? I mean, we're not going to disclose exact numbers, but... Um... 
multiple multitudes of multipliers higher than you know the 120,000 or 130,000 a month you're doing you know where we're well into the millions and millions and, and tens of millions of calls that we're processing walk me through what's involved in setting properly setting up stir shaken so it all starts with a digital certificate right so where do you get that certificate what's the cost etc Sure, I think you gotta take a step back actually. It starts before the certificate. So the certificate is what you use, like the, think of it as the SSL cert you'd get from a uh, SSL provider, right? right? Like Let's Encrypt, which are free now, or GoDaddy, or whoever you would use for your SSL cert. The first thing you have to do is you have to get a token issued to you by um, the general authority, the, the PA, and it's a uh, company called iConnective, and they issue you a token. You know, that cost you thousands a year. I don't know if I'm allowed to disclose the exact amounts, um, but it's thousands a year you spend on a token. It's actually a percentage of your 499 filing revenue. Oh, okay. Got it. So the FCC 499 filing that every voice service provider is supposed to do. We know lots don't, right, Chris? That's another topic we could spend a lot of time on. Absolutely. But, but to get that token, you have to be a 499 filer. And what you pay for the token is a percentage of your 499 filing, but there's a minimum yearly fee. So if you're small, there's still a minimum of a multiple, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Once you get that token and fill out the application, then you get this big test case of things that you got to go test against. And this test case is multiple pages long of test case against a sandbox. And you do that with taking that token and getting your certificate issued. So now you got your token from iConnective. Now you got to go get a certificate and and sign that certificate with your token. And you know there's a half a dozen certificate authorities that you can go buy that certificate to. And you know, unfortunately, unlike a website SSL that's a hundred bucks or less a year, it's thousands a year uh, for a certificate. Right. And there are multiple companies that can offer it, but only one yes. company that can get you the token. Yes, you have to get your token from one. It's what's called the, I believe they call them the GA, the General Authority. Um, it's who was put in charge of implementing, you know, overseeing the nonprofit group that's over that's in charge of overseeing everything. Uh, but that's not it, right? I mean, like myself as yep. a reseller of services from, you know, VoIP yep. Innovations, or if you're reselling bandwidth or, or Vitality yep. or whomever, yep. you still now have to have your own complete infrastructure uh, in a data center or in the cloud, like for all of my customers, I was just terminating them to voice uh, VoIP Innovations uh, yep. servers, right? That's no longer yeah, so good that, enough because their servers can't sign my calls. So then what does it take for, what would it take for me to set that up if I wanted to? There are ways that you could sign calls without um, having to put in your own SBCs, but now you're starting to do things like rely on each PBX signing the call. Right. So you'd have the PBX reach out. There's there's some companies out there who are offering services where you fork the call into them first. Oh, and wow. they sign it with your certificate and then they send the call back to your PBX to actually send out your carrier. And that, so all they're doing and is, that would be is like adding a, the header for you. Like in free PBX world, that would be like a function of asterisk handling that? Yes, and it takes actually a patch in PJ SIP. So the company oh. like one of the companies I know that's doing this, they have a patch in PJ SIP that you have to apply. And then that allows you in free PBX you would set up a trunk to them, and in your outbound routes, your first trunk would be this provider, this this signing provider, and then your second trunk would be to wipe innovations, right? Right. So you're adding more processing because now free PBX slash asterisk sends it to that first provider. They won't actually take the call. They're just going to take all the information, sign it with your certificate, and send the call back to you with all the header information to asterisk. But since the call got rejected, that causes asterisk to go to the next trunk inside your outbound route. And then the patch they have in PJ SIP is to apply that header into the next trunk call of that call so that when it goes to VI, it has your header in it. So yes, there's convoluted ways of doing this. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like kind of like a, a you know, bubble gum and Band-Aid solution, honestly. Yes, and, and asterisk did some work to do stir shaking, but I don't know anyone who's successfully implemented it. Mm. Um, and again, you know, where the call is really supposed to be signed is is under the ATIS guidelines, you know, especially if you want to sign a call with an A, and I know you're gonna, you've talked about this. Yeah. It's got to be signed by the originating service provider. Right. So in, in this scenario, um, if you take your, your former crosstalk SIP stuff, you were the originating service yes. provider. 
Even though I was reselling okay. VoIP Innovations, yep. I am technically the provider. I did have my own 499 filing, and so therefore yep. I'm responsible for actually signing the calls. Yes, and then VoIP Innovations would pass that signature through um, th that signed call. They're, they would pass it through as long as they're set up for it. I don't know if they are. Um, we are, for example, clearly a piece of trunking. We'll take, if somebody's already signed the call, we'll pass it through. We won't re-sign it. Sure. But the proper way of doing it would be, you'd have to go put up your own SBC infrastructure. Right. So the calls from your customer PBXs wouldn't go right to VI like you had. They'd come into your SBCs first, and then they could go to VI or whoever. Yeah. Um, but the, but that's the trick. In, in setting up SBCs, I've heard people say, oh, I'll just throw up a, a Camellia or two. Well, there's a lot <laughs> more work into setting up a proper call routing with redundancy and failover and all of your 911 handling. Sure, because um, you, you can't just put up an SBC in a cloud. You can't fire up a virtual machine and it, you know make it an SBC. You have to have redundancy. And then you know yep. e even at the level of just hundreds of thousands of calls that we were doing a month, you have to have the redundancy there. You also probably have to have geographic redundancy and have at yep. least like one set of SBCs on each side of the country. Yeah, and then you got to further, right? Because the SBCs have to know about um, a lot of information about your customers. They need to know all the dids and what customer they map to mm -hmm. um, because the customer's registering to them. They have to know, if you're doing registered trunks, they have to know about all the SIP usernames and passwords. If you're doing IP auth, they have to know about all the IP addresses. So now you have to have a way of configuring that. Right. And some, you know, there's commercial SBCs out there with UIs for it all. There's open source ones. But it's, it's a whole other layer of management for you. Sure. And, and then. And I imagine there, I mean, a lot of the configuration of those SBCs, if not done manually, would have to be done programmatically through APIs and stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Or config files or whatever. Yeah. Yep. You know, and then let's not even talk about get deep into 911. But you, know, you can't simply just say, oh, somebody called 911. I'm just going to pass the call through. Now you got to have some type of way of doing things like. Is the call ID the actual proper 911 call ID that's been set up with a 911 record right. before you pass that through to your carrier? Um, and if it's not, what are you going to do? And there's a lot of business logic in an SBC. Essentially, those things, right? The certificate, the token, the SBC infrastructure, that was way more than I personally wanted to get into as far as Crosstalk SIP, which is why we ultimately said, you know what? We're stepping out of this business. It's it's just too much, right? But Yep. Let's say I just pushed forward and didn't do any of that. Like, what are the yep. penalties for not signing calls and not becoming stir shake and compliant? Well, that's a lot of gray areas and a lot of black and white areas. The FCC has been sending out lots of letters. Mm -hmm. So let's take one step back maybe on that. Um, the FCC, prior to even stir shaking for the small providers coming out, required all of us service providers that if we're dealing with the reseller, we have to verify that reseller is registered on a national database called the Robocall Mitigation Database. Right, yes. Probably heard of it. Which we were, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. And originally, there was an exemption on that database that said, as long as you're under 100,000 subscribers, you had an extra year to implement stir shaking, but you had to have a Robocall Mitigation Plan in place, a written plan that you provided to them. Right. Right. Well, they changed all that effective July 1st, I think it was. If you're under 100,000 subscribers, you've had to implement by July 1st. Right. And they kind of they kind of snuck that one in there. We, we uh, Luckily, we, we were already making plans to get off of Crosstalk Tip at that time. But I remember the, getting that notice and being like, oh, man, I'm glad we made the right decision. Well, they ruled that. They ruled that. They, they announced it in December. They gave everyone six months. So it wasn't a shock. Uh, but you have to pay attention to the industry, right? Yeah. So the problem is, the problem is the robocall mitigation database isn't as simple anymore as just having a robocall mitigation plan. Because one of the questions there is, what is your, what, where are you at with stir shaking implementation? Yeah. And a lot of companies like Crosstalk SIP would say, I'm fully stir shaking compliant because you relied on your upstream provider right. to be so, and they were. The yeah. problem with that, as you learned, is as soon as that July 1st deadline hit, the FCC was pretty smart and they said, okay, everyone who said they were fully stir shake and compliant, they went and verified if you actually had a certificate issued in a token. If you didn't, they know that you were you couldn't be compliant. Yeah. And they started sending out letters, yeah. They're pretty threatening letters, right? right? I mean, these weren't nice letters. They were, no. you, you know, <laughs> you need to fix this. Uh, you know, and they came from legal. You know, this yeah. wasn't just some little person. This was from the legal department. And it's it's funny too, because like in sort of the grand scheme of things, you know, it, there's so much gray area for such a long time. You know, yep. we talked about this months ago when I was first looking into like whether I should become stir shaken compliant. 
And I called my rapid VoIP innovations and I said, do I have to worry about this basically? Yeah. And they told me, no, you don't. You're fine, right? And they said, but... And what did your good friend Tony tell you? <laughs> your my good friend Tony said, no, you do. So I, they said, you're fine. And they said, but you should probably talk to a lawyer. They gave me a, re, uh, a referral to a, a telecom lawyer, who I then yep. talked to the telecom lawyer. The telecom lawyer also said, I was fine. As long as I was under yep. the VoIP Innovations umbrella, I would be totally covered and stir shaken compliant. Turns out, neither of them were correct. They were both wrong. <laughs> and And it was like a a gray area in the rules that everyone misinterpreted. And then the FCC came back around that July, June, July timeframe and clarified yeah. and said, no, no, no. If you are a reseller of VoIP services, you now have to have your own certificate and be stir shaking compliant. And you have to sign all the calls yourself. I, I think the easy way to explain it is if you're the one charging the customer, you're the service provider. Yeah, that's a good Whoever's way of looking at it. Whoever's charging the end sure. user. That's the easiest way to, that's how we explain it when resellers ask us. Whoever's charging the end user, you're the originating service provider as per the ADA spec. Yeah. You're the, you're, the call is initiating initially with you. That call needs to be signed by you. Now you're exempt initially because you're under 100,000 subscribers, but that exemption ran up July 1st. Right. And we're seeing it, right? The big intermediate providers, the wholesalers of the world, the bandwidths and IntelliQuint, right? You've seen the letters from IntelliQuint, um, Cinch IntelliQuint, saying, we're no longer going to sign calls on behalf of customers within A. You yeah. Know, you go get your own certificate and give it to us, and we'll sign for you. But if if you don't give us your own certificate, we're only going to sign it with a C as a gateway provider, because technically they're an intermediate gateway provider at that point. Yeah. And, and they then, shouldn't be signing it with an A. We So FCC really, we haven't heard about any actual like monetary penalties or anything happening, right? I haven't. FCC usually doesn't do that instantly. They give a lot of time for people right. to actually get compliant. But let's say, so you as the carrier... Uh, mm -hmm. Now, when you receive a call, when a call comes yep. into your services, yep. and let's say it has an attestation level of C, right? Yep. Wh how do you decide, like, or how does it? How is it marked as spam? Uh, okay. It, it, that's not the entire story, right? There's there's mul no. there's multiple layers of it, but that's something there's that can definitely ding you, so to speak. Yes. So the attestation level is one indicator of potential spam, yep. right? Or yep. robocalling. It's an indicator. Um, the problem is I can't get into the depths of how the algorithms of spam works because spam writing, because like anyone else, we use a third party who specializes in this. So we it. pay a service. It's costly, but it's worth it. And we set, we have a lot of control over the filters they're using mm. and how things get rated. Um, again, a lot of NDAs in this industry, as you've learned, right? Yeah. I can't get into all the details, but yes, it has some level to it. But what we're learning is, uh, the mobile providers, uh, T-Mobile, for example, we are hearing from customer after customer after customer of likely spam, likely spam showing up. Ah. And when we have them call our test number from whoever called them showing likely spam, if it's a friend of theirs, they'll call our test number and nine times out of 10, they have a C level signing on it yeah so they they are under a carrier that is not properly doing stir shaken or they're just no, getting they're properly or, or they're properly they're signing with a c they're signing with a c right yeah which is yep which i mean I, I say not properly as in you should have an a if you're calling out you should the problem is there's still some great there's still some problems with the stir shaken infrastructure mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is um stir shaken is only enforced currently if it's an IP network. Right. We know a lot of traffic in this country still isn't IP. Now, the FCC has come out with a mandate on non-IP networks next year have to implement a variation of stir shaken. Right. Um, like ISIG and, and different protocols that allow you know, within the SS7 to do this, and there's solutions for it, but they have a little more time before they have to implement it. So the problem is, let's say the call starts as IP somewhere. Yeah. But then it hits some carrier who isn't IP, who then moves it back to SS7. And then it finally goes to the next carrier who goes back to IP. Right. That intermediate carrier that took it from SS7 to IP, they don't have any information on what it was. Yeah, they're stripped so and they're, they there's, no, there's no SIP header. It's all stripped out. Yeah. yeah. So what, what can that, that carrier who took it, it started as IP, got signed with an A. Then it hit somebody who was not IP out in a backhaul somewhere. And then it got converted back to IP. At the time they converted back to IP, that carrier, they don't know it was an A before that. Right. And 
that's a gateway call. They're an intermediate provider, so they can only sign that with a C. Right. They can't sign it with an A or a B at that point. Yeah. You know, we talk about like what a carrier, like you know, Crosstalk SIP should do to become compliant. Uh, we know there's a lot of carriers out there that don't care about any of this. They don't follow the yep. compliance at all. Um, yep. Or, you know, there's, uh, you know, folks that are doing robocalling internationally. Like they've got a yep. Vichy dial set up somewhere, uh, yep. you know, else in, in Europe or India so or you've somewhere. Seen, you've seen all the stuff from the FCC. The first thing is the robocall mitigation database. Right. Everyone everyone is supposed to be on there, right? So what happens here now is, remember in the past with the robocall mitigation database, you could say you're not stir shaking compliant, but you have a robocall mitigation plan in place. Yeah. Now you can't do that anymore, right? Now that you have to say you have full stir shaking on the robocall mitigation database, you won't be able to register there unless you have stir shaking, hmm. okay? Me as a per voice service provider, not even a carrier, just a voice service provider, I have to verify you as a reseller are right. on that database. Otherwise, I cannot accept your calls. So, but I mean, how does that affect someone who just fired up uh, an Astra server, or Vichadel server in a different country that's not regulated by the FCC and they're making calls into the U.S. but spoofing U.S. dids? Yep. yep. So that's where the FCC's come down with this new, with the whole international gateway provider saying, "No more. This has got to end. You have to know your customer." Mm -hmm. And or, but, you but are or else, to start or else what? That. Or else what? Block the traffic. They're telling us to block oh, the traffic. Oh, really? So they don't want that stuff coming in. That's going to be the big mandate. Like they're they're still trying to figure out better ways to handle that. But you're going to see a lot of movement quickly. FCC is not moving slowly on this stuff, and is you know they're really cracking down. So how, all they can do is they can they can't crack down on the guy sitting in India. They have to crack down on whoever in the U.S. is introducing that call into the U.S network gotcha and that's who they're going to crack down on so is... and they've, they've already done that they they sent out some really nasty notices to all the carriers saying you have to block calls from all these illegitimate service providers who are bringing in international traffic illegally is there a date when there's kind of like a cutoff where carriers are going to be required <laughs> to drop those calls i gotta go look again because it doesn't affect us with the way our business is yeah so i don't follow it a hundred percent i know there were some dates what i don't remember is were these final rulings or were these proposed rulings? You know how the FCC, it's a multi-step process. They right. have meetings, they do their proposed rules, then they have their actual rules, then they have their implementation timeline. I forget what phase it was at, but yes, it's actively being implemented. Right. So earlier in the video, I talked about the test number that you set up that people can call yep. in order to check their own phone numbers at the station level, right? Yes. Um, Let's say someone calls that number and they get a B or a C, but they really want mm -hmm. to be, you know, at that A level. What yep. should they do? If they're using a SIP trunk, they should call Chris at Crosstalk and he can get them <laughs> hooked up with a proper SIP trunk. Well, that's true. But like, let's say beyond that, beyond the, the self-promotion, uh, what like they would have to go talk to, they'd have to go talk to their carrier. So right? it's, it's, it's on using. their carrier then to, yes. to fix that for them. Yes. Yes. How, what about, let me ask you, all right, well, final question, because I just thought of this. Follow me, right? Yep. You you call me from your cell phone, you hit my yep. PBX, and your PBX yep. forwards your call out to my cell phone with yep. your cell phone's caller ID. So yep. my PBX is essentially spoofing your number. Yep. How yep. is Verizon handling that when I get it on my cell phone? That depends, right? So in the Clearly IP world, because we know the customer, we sign it with a B. Which means because, you know the customer, but you can't verify the did. Yes. Now, we are working on some custom stuff that that um, will work on our cloud platform or for SIP trunking customers that are using free PBX because it's some custom dial plan and a header we're going to have to do, which is basically if free PBX, if the call comes in from us, so we're your inbound carrier, the call comes in, there's header information. Yeah. We're going to have, if the call goes through a follow me or call forwarding, we're going to forward back on an identifier from that header back to us. Okay. That way we know that it was through follow me for, call forwarding, which means you technically have a right. Because remember, the law isn't you have to own the call ID, the number. It says you have to have a right to use it. Gotcha. Okay. So in that scenario, they have a right to use it because they're doing, they're doing the, the um, pinhole, not pinholing, um, Hairpinning. Right. Hair bringing pin, the call yeah. in and back mm -hmm. out, right? So we're just hairpinning it back through. So we just need asterisk to pass that through or free PBX to pass that through. And we're working on a way of doing that so we can actually then sign that follow me call with an A. 
Oh, that's crazy. And I don't, I mean, I don't know who else is doing that. <laughs> They're probably... well, you, it's, but nobody, because it takes actually dial plan and free PBX, which means you have to have a module right. with your trunking to do it. So it, it's a really neat thing that we're working on a solution for our customers. Oh, for. that's crazy. Well, Tony, uh, as always, you are a wealth of information. I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, for everyone who's interested in open source PBX training with myself and Tony Lewis, where you can bend his ear for hours on end about this <laughs> kind of stuff, uh, make sure you check out events.clearlyip.com. Our next training is coming up in early November. All right, Tony, thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. So there you have it. The additional cost of tokens and certificates, the learning curve and effort involved in setting up a proper redundant SBC infrastructure, and the increased scrutiny from regulatory entities such as the FCC have killed our SIP business. Rest in peace, Crosstalk SIP. It was fun while it lasted. <laughs>